Over the summer, I've been doing a, a short series on the gospel, and I'm coming to the conclusion of it this morning. We've been looking in different books of the Bible, in Timothy at the glorious gospel, in Ephesians at the mystery of the gospel, in Acts 20, the grace of the gospel, and last week, 1 Corinthians we looked at the power of the gospel. This morning, I want to conclude that short series with a, a sermon based on verses 6 through 9 from Galatians, and to title it, No Other Gospel. No Other Gospel. We live in a day and age where fakes are everywhere. You can't even trust the news that you pick up because we're told that there are such a thing as fake news. We find counterfeit goods being sold. And there's nothing worse than buying something and finding out it's not what you thought it was. What Paul is dealing with in Galatians is people who claim to be Christians but are fakes. That should make every one of us pause and consider. Am I the real thing? Do I have the stamp of God's spirit on my life? Or is my life really just a sad mixture of things that I be making up? There is a verse in Romans 8 and verse 9 which says, If anyone does not have the spirit of Christ... He does not belong to Christ. Being sure that you're believing the right thing and trusting the only Savior is absolutely vital. Because what I'll argue this morning is there are no fake Christians. You're either a Christian or you're not. And there's no middle path. Paul, by God's grace, will help us address that today because we do live in a world where there's a great deal of fake Christianity and we need help and we find that help in the word of God so that we might be equipped for whatever comes across our path. I want to consider verses 6 through 9 under three subheadings. The fixed gospel, the fake gospel, and the full gospel. Let me see if I can tease these things out for you. Verse 6 says, I marvel that you are turning away so soon from him who called you in the grace of Christ. That, dear friends, I'm going to argue, is the fixed gospel. That, dear friends, is a definition of the gospel. We've considered its glory. We've considered its mystery. We've been reminded that it's a work of grace and that it's powerful in that it changes people forever. Here, God's great love, his incredible mercy, and the salvation which he brings to undeserving sinners. It's a revelation of the holiness of God. It's a revelation of his holy love sinners and it's established in Jesus Christ I marvel that you are turning away so soon from him who called you in the grace of Christ it's so good it's important that we take time to guard it protect it and share it because here is the appointed means for men and women to be saved. It's a matter of eternal life or death, whether you've understood the gospel or whether you've been sold a fake or you're a fake yourself. The New Testament is resplendent with verses which remind us that the gospel is a fixed body of truth. It's not something that you can take 80% off and leave the other 20% or whatever other computation you dream up. You either have it all or you have nothing at all. Listen 
to the little letter of Jude, verse 3. Beloved, while I was very diligent to write to you concerning our common salvation, I found it necessary to write to you, exhorting you to contend earnestly for the faith which was once for all delivered to the saints. Grab that picture. Jude set out to write a letter to Christians to encourage them. And if you read that little book, it's only one chapter. What he has to do is warn about people who've come in to the Christian community and they're undermining the gospel. The gospel which was once for all delivered to the saints. The gospel which is not up for negotiation. Paul refers to it in 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 3. For I delivered to you, first of all, that which I also received. That word received in the original language describes an official package which is being passed on. Galatians chapter 2 and verse 4. You'll find why Paul is having to address this subject. This occurred because of false brethren who secretly brought in false teaching to whom we did not yield submission for an hour. Why didn't you bend with the contemporary mood of society that Christ, sorry, that the truth of the gospel might continue with you? That the truth of the gospel might continue. And then later he writes to Timothy, oh, Timothy, guard what was committed to your trust. Avoiding the profane and idle babblings and contradictions of what is falsely called knowledge. It's interesting, isn't it? People trying to change the gospel is not a new thing. The book of Galatians is generally considered to be one of the first of the New Testament epistles to be written. And so right at the very beginning, there were people who were looking at the gospel and saying, I'm not sure I like that. Let me just change this or that part. And Paul says so clearly here and throughout scripture that that is not an option. Look at how he begins verse 6. I marvel that you are turning away so soon. That word marvel is a, a word which describes being having your breath taken away. And I think we, we don't see that just in the English. In Yorkshire, they have a lovely term. It's called being gobsmacked. I'm gobsmacked. That you're turning away, and the word so soon means so quickly. The church has just been established in Galatia. For geography's sake, it's modern Turkey. They argue whether it's north or south, so I'm not going to settle that today. Modern Turkey's near enough. And right then, when the gospel was being planted by the grace of God, there were people coming in and were saying, listen, folks, Christianity came out of Judaism. And if you really want to be a Christian, what you need to do is adopt the Jewish practices first. And that was most clearly seen in circumcision, in the foods that you ate and various other things. And here is the New Testament expert in Judaism. Let's remember who Paul is. It would appear he was being trained to take over the theological institutions of Judaism in Jerusalem. And that's why he was so angry and determined to eliminate this Christian thing. So when he talks about Judaism, it's not somebody standing out throwing, outside throwing stones. He knows what he's talking about. And he is very clear that this attempt to remerge Christianity and Judaism is undermining the gospel. Later on in this book, you'll find that he even has to stand up to the apostle Peter because Peter has been sucked in by it. So it's no light thing. Paul is 
gobsmacked. And I, I believe he uses this Greek word, which is translated marvel, deliberately to make people go, oh. And sometimes you and I need that kind of a nudge, shock, or push. Because let's face it, we're all nice people, aren't we? And all those people that disagree with us, they're nice people. And you don't really want to be at odds with nice people. Well, says Paul, there's a level at which you need to be honest with nice people. And make it very clear that there's nothing about the gospel that is up for negotiation. The gospel that the eternal God planned in eternity to send his son and that that son came through the womb of Mary, lived amongst us, died as a perfectly innocent substitute for sinners and rose again on the third day and then sent the disciples out to tell everybody so that whoever believes that would become a new kind of person, a new creature. That's the gospel, dear friends. And anybody who tinkers with that is, in fact, a fake or developing fake Christianity. <clears throat> I did go to Bible school once many moons ago. And one of the things you have to learn is about all these twists and turns that have been taken down through history. And you find that Christianity has been exposed time after time after time to the ideas of men and women who want to say, listen, the church has got it wrong and you need to come to where we are. It's the foundation of every cult that exists. You always find at the center of it, we now have the truth which nobody else knew. It's also the thing that's undermined established Christianity. I'm old enough to remember when the Bishop of Durham said that the resurrection was a conjuring trick with bones. I could bring out others, but I'll just pause for a minute. You need to... Measure professing Christians by the gospel. There might be room for differences in other areas, but when it comes to the gospel, the message of God's salvation, there is only one gospel. A gospel which is proclaimed fearlessly. And when you turn away from it, you are, in fact, betraying God. It's in the text, again, where it says, I marvel that you are turning away. That word in the original language means you've become a turncoat. It was used to describe a soldier who had abandoned his military position. It sort of brings out the seriousness of it, doesn't it? That there is only one gospel. And all our hope hangs on the integrity of the gospel. Who Jesus is. Why he came. Why he suffered and died on that cross. Was he just another Jewish rebel? Or was he who he claimed to be? The living word of God. Who had come to do for mankind. What mankind could never have done for himself. Some people might wonder, why is the Old Testament longer than the New Testament? There are many reasons, but here's one. So that there would be no confusion about how hopelessly sinful mankind is. All have sinned, Paul says in Romans 3. And come short of the glory of God. Time after time, God dealt with people in the Old Testament even people who were far from perfect. And eventually what happens at the end of the Old Testament, as Stephen sums up in Acts chapter 7, that the Jews killed everybody that ever spoke about God. And they were a stiff-necked people. That's one reason for the Old Testament. It prepares us for God's unique way of salvation. Get your head round it. It's, it. it's an amazing, incredible thing. 
that the creator of the world entered the virgin's womb, was born as a baby, grew up as a boy, and never did anything wrong. I'm a parent. Three kids God's given us. I've watched the little scallywags. No, wait a minute. I was one of them once. Jesus lived the perfect life and he even had the Roman authorities declare it to be so. I find no wrong in this man. Why was he killed then? Go back to your Old Testament. Psalm 22 describes in graphic detail God's plan to provide a substitute. Go back into the Old Testament, into the sacrificial system, where innocent creatures were, were executed in the place of wicked people. All those pictures must have been in John the Baptist's mind when he says, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. I am the way, says Jesus. He didn't say, I am a way. I am the way, the truth, the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. It's absolutely vitally important then that we recognize that the gospel is a fixed body of truth which is provided for our encouragement, dear friends. There will be times when, like the Galatians, you need to be brought up short and challenged about how you're living and where you're going. But when you understand it and you're resting in the beauty of God's great love and kindness and mercy, then it's an encouragement to us, the source of our joy. This world's joy is fleeting. But when you understand that you're loved from eternity, that Christ suffered and died for you, how is it possible that anybody would ever go off in a different direction? Wait a minute, they've been doing it for generations. I marvel. I marvel that you are turning away so soon. Notice, from him. From Christ. And that should make all of us passionate about the gospel. It's not just a story in a book. It's a person. The eternal second person of the Trinity. Who loved me. Who gave himself for me. And he calls me to walk before him continually. So this first section challenges me and you, I hope, to stay true to Christ. If he has saved you. Then give him the glory in your heart where you're sitting right now. We had a discussion last Sunday night about whether we should say hallelujah in the service. This is the point for it. Praise the Lord. You see, Christianity is, is much more than, a, than something written in a book. It's the most incredible, profoundly beautiful thing that you will ever, ever find. Get a hold of it because it's the only way that you'll be equipped to stand against the modern tide of unbelief that is permeating society. And you can check whether it's still important to you. When you read about Christ, when you think about it, when you pray to him, does it still excite you? It's over 50 years since I first became a Christian. But there's something special about that. But if I have to go back 50 years to experience that specialness, there's something wrong with me. Every day is like becoming a Christian for the first time for a believer. Am I listening to him? Am I really following one of the reasons for empty church buildings today is because that gospel has been undermined. Many people know of C.H. Spurgeon. He, 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 he wrote a book called The Downgrade Controversy. And that was around 1850-ish, maybe a wee bit later. And it always amazes me that he could see way back then where Christianity was heading. 
They were getting too clever for themselves. And you and I need to be able to see that and recognize that when people come to you with a new form of Christianity, whether they knock on your door or whether they're standing on street corners and they're going to tell you, I've suddenly got the light that everybody else is missing. Close the door. Be nice, but close the door. There is no improvement on the gospel. It's fixed. And that surely must be a great encouragement to the unbeliever. You see, there are people who come to churches like ours and they're still not in the kingdom of God. Let's understand that God's salvation, though it's profound, magnificent and beautiful, is simple. What does God say to the unbeliever? Repent. That means change how you think. That means change the direction of your life. Repent and believe. Now you tell the unbeliever that and they say, I can't do it. I know that. Because the ability to do that is a supernatural work of God. But he gives you a new heart. He changes your desire. And he sets you on the highway of holiness. Nonetheless, you're still responsible because your unwillingness to come is an indictment against you that will be held against you on the judgment day. Flee from the wrath to come. Don't just muddle along and see whether it happens or not. Flee because God is holy and you're not. Christ died for sinners and sinners who trust him are absolutely saved. We're not perfect. We will be, but we're not. Let me take you then to my second point. And let's look for a minute at what he calls at the end of verse 6, a different gospel, which is not another, but there are some who trouble you and want to pervert the gospel of Christ. But even if we are an angel from heaven, preach any other doctrine to you than what we have preached to you, let him be accursed. There are some profound words in there. What's the essence of the fake gospel, the fake Christianity? It is turning people back on their own efforts. They tell you, yes, you can do this, that, then the next thing, but you have to do it. And so right here in Pickering, there's a group of people who have, who have to spend 20 hours a month working to impress God. You know them as Jehovah's Witnesses. But it's not just there. In many of places called churches, people are told, be good, try harder, give more. Dedicate yourself more. And then maybe God will see your good. The growth of Islam in this country and throughout the world is, is a nightmare in this sense. They really do believe that at the end of the world, there's a set of scales taken out and your good is balanced against your evil. The tragedy is you will always have more evil than good. And you're in a disaster area. The false gospels, the false religions conflict with Christianity because they play into the delusion that people can do things to impress God. And even amongst us evangelicals, we can slip into that thinking. I have only one reason for my hope of being in heaven, and that is Christ died for me. He gave me a treasure which I've messed up often. And as I stand, I will be amazed in the presence of Jesus, the Savior divine, that he could love a sinner like me. That's the gospel. And anybody who, who tries to tangle you up in other things is preaching a different gospel. Notice Paul's words, which is not another. Again, a little bit of Greek understanding in these words are helpful. That word different and that word another 
are related in the original language. Different means another of a different kind, but another means another of the same kind. And Paul's language is quite specific. This idea that you need to be circumcised, that was the plan then, wasn't it? That you need to adopt Judaism is not another of the same kind as the gospel. It is, in fact, different. Because it's turning people to depend on themselves. It's turning people to embrace schemes that are unfit for purpose. When, it, when you buy something that's fake or you get something that's fake, there's a horrible sense of disappointment, isn't there? When you take it out of his packet and you find it doesn't work. We all like bargains, at least where I come from. And you go for a bargain and what happens? It comes and you think, why on earth did I bother? There are no bargains in Christianity. It is a bargain. And it calls you to summon yourself to it. Are you familiar with the words in Isaiah 64 verse 6? They're a good standard to go by. We are all like an unclean thing. And all our righteousnesses, that's all the good things we do, are like filthy rags. Like filthy rags. What good is a filthy rag? Again, some of us men hold on to them, don't we? We've got them in the garage or the shed. And we think, well, maybe use it again one more time. Well, where should a filthy rag go? God give us wives to put us on the straight and narrow. In the bed. So what you do when you come to God is you don't bring a list of the imaginary good things you've been doing. Because God has already declared them only fit for the bin. There's only one hope and that's Christ. Again, listen to Paul as he writes to the Philippians chapter 3. But what things were gain to me, these I have counted loss for Christ. Philippians 3, 7. Get the picture. What things I counted gain. That, that was his Jewish life. That was his Jewish learning. That was his Jewish sacrificial living. I counted loss for Christ. And what are you talking about, Paul? Yes, indeed. I also count all things loss for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish. He knew Isaiah 64, verse 8. And count them as rubbish, the old author I says, and count them as dung. Only the dung beetle collects dung. Only the dung beetle thinks it's something worthwhile to have. All our religious upbringing, all our religious devotion, all our religious efforts do not impress God. It's not another gospel. And if you go on here, it's a perversion of the gospel of Christ. If God could have saved people by their own efforts, Jesus would never have come and there would be no need. There are many great men and women of faith in the Old Testament, but they were all flawed. I read recently, I'd forgotten about Moses being a murderer. David being an adulterer and a murderer. Abraham, a liar and a deceiver. There's nobody back there to sort of take as your model. They're all there to tell you, you need a savior. And Jesus is that savior. People who want to move away from what they might call the old fashioned gospel are not improving on it. They're destroying it and robbing people of their eternal hope. Galatians is a fascinating book. Chapter 3, verse 1. Listen to how he talks to them there. Oh, foolish Galatians. 
but he doesn't stop there. Who has bewitched you that you should not obey the truth? Foolish Galatians, he's, he, he's trying to stir them back to the gospel, you see. And he wants them to understand the madness of what they're doing. Chapter 4 and verse 9. But now, after you have known God, or rather are known by God, how is it that you turn again to the weak and beggarly elements, that's circumcision, the weak and beggarly elements to which you desire again to be in bondage? Chapter 5, verse 7. You ran well. Who hindered you from obeying the truth? You grab the picture of you, you see. Paul is, is, is very clear. And the Bible is very clear. That there's only one gospel. And that there is a concerted movement to, to, to distract people from it. Who's behind it? 2 Corinthians 11 verse 3. I fear lest somehow as the serpent deceived Eve by his craftiness. So your minds may be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. Lovely words. It acknowledges Satan. We live in a world where there is a, is he a monster? A wicked evil entity. Who has a vested interest in undermining the gospel. And who never gives up. He knows there's a judgment coming. But in the meantime, he's attempting to get as many people into that judgment as he is. And he's relentless. Again, in Corinthians, Paul talks about him appearing as an angel of light. He doesn't come as the guy with the red suit and the horns on. He comes as somebody who looks smart. Who's considered to be nice. And who wants you to abandon the gospel. To turn away from it. To substitute for the gospel, your own efforts. Notice how Paul sums up their destiny. But even if we are an angel from heaven, just pause there for a minute. The Mormons believe an angel from heaven came down and helped Joseph Smith translate those golden plates he's supposed to have found. Even though we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel to you than what we have preached to you, let him be Cursed. That word accursed is a, a very serious word. Anathema is the basis of the Greek word, and you might be familiar from the authorized version where Paul talks about Maranatha. Uh, anathema Maranatha, doesn't he, in Corinthians? Or it's translated that way. Anathema means to be devoted to destruction. So that those people who are bending, reshaping, misshaping the gospel are not just a wee bit mistaken, they're heading for hell. And as soon as you understand that, then your heart should be stirred with compassion toward them. You want them to come to where you are, but you'll have nothing to do with where they are. And he repeats it in verse 9, doesn't he? I always think when God repeats himself, it's because it's important. Let him be accursed. There's only one gospel. Beware of dogs, says Paul to the Philippians. Beware of evil workers. Beware of the mutilation. Mutilation is a, a description of circumcision. For we are the circumcision who worship God in the spirit, rejoice in Christ Jesus, and have no confidence in the flesh. No confidence. I don't think because I've read umpteen books or because I spend X hours in prayer or attend this number of meetings or that number of meetings that somehow God's going to say, well done you. There's only one reason for God's well done. 
and that is for trusting his son as your saviour. The fake gospel is all around us. Even in beautiful North Yorkshire. And it's not just in the cults. So many places that go under the title of church have turned away from Christ. They're now accepting things that were that are condemned in the scripture as right. When the Bishop of York was confronted at the Synod earlier this year, I think it was, by somebody who was telling them, you can't change the word of God. The Bishop of York says the Bible needs to be brought up to date. Pardon? Who are these people? No matter how nice they are, how pleasant they may be, they need to be seen as what they are. The agents of the enemy. So I come to you, dear friends, are you trusting Christ and Christ alone? When you stand on the judgment day and an angel says, why, why, why should God let you in here? What will your answer be? I've got mine worked out and it will be this simple, Christ died for me. Christ died for me. We're living in an age when Christianity is being deliberately undermined. Opera, one of the foremost presenters on our television and media, has become an advocate of what's called Christ consciousness. Sounds good, doesn't it? I listened to her yesterday on YouTube. It's a great resource. She used to believe that the gospel was about Jesus dying for her. These are her words. And that through him she would have salvation. But she had become aware that what she needed was Christ consciousness. It sounds good, but what it actually means is a, a, an Eastern philosophy that says that Jesus was not God. But what he did was he got to the state where he ascended higher into the, 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 the Gnostic world of knowledge and was equipped there. And that every one of us then need to come to that consciousness. She's an enemy of the gospel. And there are many like her. Who smile. I've got money. Influence. Dear friends. You need to get back to the gospel. Back to the gospel. And the unbeliever needs to be able to see the difference. The New Age movement believes that all religions except Christianity are right. Because it's only Christianity that says there's only one way. And they say, no, there's a hundred thousand ways. Dear friends, understand the difference. And we need to impress that on the unbeliever. That, as somebody very clever once said, there are only two religions in the world. Do and done. All religions are about what you do. Only Christianity says it's about what Christ has done. And even what I do as a Christian doesn't add to that. And so I invite you as a non-believer to come to Christ. Rest in what he's done. Stop that wrestling and attempting to work out something else and to be better. You will never succeed. But Jesus is able to make you whole. My time is gone. I just want to mention in a few moments what I've called the full gospel. Verse 9, as we have said before, so now I say again. If anyone preaches any other gospel to you, and here it is, than what you have received. The received word of God. It's what you have in your Bible. The received word of God. It's not a message you're going to get from somewhere up there. It's in the Bible. God took time to speak. The Holy Spirit took time to have it recorded. The Holy Spirit uses it generation after generation to bring men and women to Christ. And it's so simple, it's hard. As many as received him, 
that which you've received, as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God. To those who believe in his name, John chapter 1. Jesus is not standing as some helpless religious leader knocking on your door. That picture is misused from the book of Revelation. It's the church door is knocking on and it's a whole different story. Jesus is not waiting for you to decide to trust him. Because left to yourself, you never will. The reason anybody becomes a Christian is because God gives them a new heart. And that new heart gives them a new desire for Christ. And they then flee to him. And they call out to him to save them. And that's, if you're not a Christian, that's where you are this morning. Why are you not asking God to save you? Why have you waited so long? Oh, that God would persuade you, even now, to flee to Christ. That you might be who he's called you to be. I need to stop. Time is gone. As we have said before, the commentaries say it doesn't mean the few verses before. It means when we were in Galatia preaching the gospel. As we have said before, so now I say again, if anyone preaches any other gospel to you than what you have received, let him be accursed. Doesn't that make you tremble for all these people out there who imagine they've got another better gospel? There's only one gospel, the old, old story. That Christ died for sinners. And sinners who believe in him are saved forever. I pray that it's your portion. <coughs> and that these summer sermons on the gospel will be parts of your Bible that are marked now. To equip you to stand for the days that lie ahead. There is no other gospel. Amen.